Let's, uh, let's just give the Lord a prayer. Father, I, I thank you for blessing of life, of being allowed to, to breathe, to speak, to come together in fellowship, to have purpose and meaning. And Lord, I just, I pray that you would, um, you would guide me in, in my mind um, and to allow me to share you uh, gave me this week, and uh, I pray, Father, that uh, through everything that is said and done this morning, that, that every person here would just turn their eyes toward you, and to know that you are God. That you are holy and righteous and just. And that all of our hope is in you. Open my mouth, I pray, for your glory. And I give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' precious name. And as we've been going through Corinthians, um, and in the section with in verse or chapter seven, it's uh, it's getting uh, very personal, and um, and that sh should be okay, and I pray that it is okay because because. Uh, Because it's the Word of God, and it is, uh, it's, it talks to really the depths of who we are, and then brings all of that together for His glory. And so, uh, but it's hard because it because it really does. It speaks to um, to some hard things and choices that we've made in our lives, and things that we have to. To live with and, and things that we have to deal with um, because of choices that we make, but uh, but to get back, um, I got the all of the kids, uh, the mere Christianity books for Christmas, and and Corey had a quote on Facebook, the quote from C.S. Lewis, and I don't I don't remember specifically, but he talks about you know people. People say, "Well, you don't want to go back." It's, it doesn't make any sense to go back. But C.S. Lewis says, "If we've gone the wrong direction, the the thing that makes the most sense is to go back." And uh, what the Word of God does is is it really gets takes us back to those places where we made bad choices. And we have to look at that so that we can go back and make right choices. And uh, it's, it is part of sanctification, part of the cleansing, part of, of the repentance and getting back in the right place. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's hard. And I, I know that it's hard because, because I'm, I've been through, I've made stupid choices in my life and I've had to face the consequences of those choices and then had to make the to go from here and go on. So uh, anyway, I'm trying to was just trying to think of, of what to share. This, um, and we're not going to go on in, in 1 Corinthians, but um, this this week I I looked into uh, or watched a the memorial service. Um, R.C. Sproul's memorial service, and uh, and as I watched the, it's about it's over an hour long, but as 
as I watched the service and just saw everything kind of unfold about this man who's, uh, who committed his adult life to studying the Word and really not just uh, being, not just really understanding the Word, but sharing it with, with other people and changing people's lives through a, just a passion for God's Word. It was, it was pretty eye-opening. And so you had these men that came up and they were talking about their relationship with R.C. Sproul and how it challenged them in their own walk. And John MacArthur uh, shared that how uh, his relationship with R.C. Sproul really um, made him dig in, into the scriptures like he'd never done before. And one of the one things that he said in there, which I think would be interesting to see, is that he debated R.C. Sproul on baptism. And John, John MacArthur, who was, who was Baptist, and, uh, and R.C. Sproul, who believes in infant baptism, and I would have loved to have heard that debate because that, it's one of those things smiles when I talk about. Huh? It's online. It's, it's just an amazing, an amazing thing because you think, how do you read the scriptures and come up with it for baptism? But anyway, so there's, and, but there's a lot of talk about just um, really iron sharpening iron as men who wrestle with hard things in the scripture have discussion with each other in fellowship. I mean, um, and how God, no matter, no matter how that comes out, how God is the one who's exalted, no matter who's right. Um, and then there was the message. And actually when the others were talking, I thought, how can you, how is it going to get better than this? But then there was the message. And, uh, and I just want to, I want to share kind of the thoughts, some of the thoughts, because the thoughts that I can think. Um, I, don't, I don't even know who the man was. You know? Sinclair Ferguson. It was who? Sinclair Ferguson. I think. Yeah. It the message. But, I mean, it was... It was, it just blew me away. But he, he shared out of Isaiah chapter 6. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, which is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. I just want to, just want to, to, Think about the, the reality of this, this relationship and, and uh, that God and the glory of God 
comes into the presence of man. And a lot of man is allowed to be in the presence of God. And this is, this is the place, I mean, kind of setting everything else aside, this is the place that is, that really sets the pinnacle of the Christian walk. So Greg was talking, has been talking about the tabernacle and, and how it represents Christ. And it, it really represents Christ. And it really is Christ tabernacling with us. And, and God tabernacling with us. God with man. And the amazing thing about that is that man's allowed to be there. Man is allowed to be there. So as, uh, we're looking at these... It's like I'm back, I'm jumping, this is, I'm jumping back down to heaven, to earth now. Man is allowed to, to be a part of this, and in being a part of this, man starts to think a lot of himself. And so we need to go back to the heavenly side of it and remember, God is, he is the glory in all of this. And for man to be allowed to be a part of this is, we ought to just be in awe of God. In every part of it. And so whenever I or whenever you start to think that there's something special about you, jump back over to, to the heavenly side. Look at the, the throne on high. And remember that the only, the only thing, the only reason that there's anything glorious about you is because God has allowed it. God has given it and God has allowed it. If we can keep that in our minds, if we can keep God lifted up high and exalted, and, and, and I could go around this room, and I would be the first to say, well, I, can, I think I can do that. But I've also have, uh, I've been around long enough, and I've wisened up enough to say, man, I know that I need to do that. But I also know that it doesn't take me very long to get sidetracked. In my, in my mind and in my heart, it doesn't take me long to get sidetracked. Woke up this morning and uh, my fan was off, which was a blessing since the heat was off. I'm glad my fan was off. But it was, it was cold and Missy said, it's cold in here. And I said, well, the electricity's off. And she was like, oh, no. And uh, so I get up. And I go to try to start the, the generator. To, I don't, I'm not sure what I was going to do with that. But, um, but as I'm getting ready, I'm thinking, you know, how long, how, how, uh, how long would it take before you would go into a panic mode? Just because there's no electricity. So there's no heat. There's no hot coffee. There's no hot oats. There's no warmth anywhere, how long would it take before you go into panic mode? What, what does it take for you to really, to where everything is just pulled out from under your feet? I was talking to Scott about it just this morning. He said, yeah, could you imagine if, if you had to, to, to reckon with the idea that you, for 25 years you won't have electricity? And I was thinking, 25 years? <laughs> I was, I was just thinking a week. <laughs> we are, we fall so quickly and so easily. I mean, just any any little thing happens, and, and our world is shaken. But God's world is never shaken. God's position is never shaken. Never shaken. And and that message revived that in me this week. Listening to that message revived that in me. I listened to the message. I read through Isaiah and I went back to Missy. Missy was back in the schoolroom and I sat down and I said, I'm an idiot. And Missy's like, what's new? <laughs> yeah, she didn't really <laughs> but was, she's like, what's going on? And I said, I mean, I just listened to this message and it's like, wow, who am I? Who do I ever think that I am? Mm -hmm. 
I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And now, I just want to spend some time on this. What the, the cherubim, the seraphim, what they sang, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All of the earth is filled with his glory. And so I am part of all of the earth. I was, uh, I have these spurts where I, I pick up my guitar and I think I'm really going to learn now. I've been doing that for 55 years. And so I look at, my, I look at this guitar and then I look at how other people play the guitar and, and my, and I'm thinking, man, I, could I ever get there? Could I ever get to that place? Because, let me, let me get a guitar. Can I use either one of these? I'm not going to play it, so I won't damage anything. When I play guitar, this is, this is a guitar. What's a guitar compared to the universe? You know, not much. But when I play guitar, these, right, these three frets, I can, I can spend my life on these three frets. You can play songs on these three frets. I mean, your chords can all kind of just stay right on these three frets. So you can do a lot of things on the guitar and just, just do that area. That's pretty amazing. People can play guitar all of their life and never leave three frets on the guitar. Maybe, maybe move over to the fourth fret. Unless they have a capo, and then you have a whole new universe at the end. <laughs> but so you have a whole guitar, and you have three frets. But man, when you see, see, see somebody who can play, and they're all over the guitar. And, and really, there's a simplicity to the guitar. I don't know what it is, but there's, people tell me that there's a simplicity to it. And, and there's just the same notes that are in different places throughout the guitar. And you just kind of have to know where they are. But you, and not only do people play all over the guitar, but people play all different styles all over the guitar. And so you can have like a blues, somebody who's playing blues, and they're, you know, they're going, they're doing something different than somebody who plays, you know, other classical styles and all kinds of different styles. And you can spend your life just learning a guitar and, and playing a guitar. And that, I think that's kind of an amazing thing. You can, you can spend your life just playing the whole part of the guitar, or you can spend your life really learning and, and playing all of the guitar. And then you have these little keys here where you can change the how each one of these strings are set up. So you can change everything. This, this is, this is a, really is, it's kind of a universe. So one instrument can be a, its own universe. And one person can spend their time just focusing on one little piece of, of a universe. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I want to serve God. Well, how would you want to serve God? I'd like to serve God by playing the guitar. Well, you picked your point. I mean, there's your world. Because there's a lot to know. And there's a lot that you can do to master the guitar and present that to God. Learn how to minister that way to God on one instrument. Isn't that amazing? And God is the glory of all of it. I could pick one thing, and I might be able to, to impress somebody with what I can do in learning one thing. And God is the glory of everybody's choice. 
This is what God has called us. That the word all is amazing. It's a small word, but it's amazing. And God is all in all. God is all in all. And, and, and what Isaiah, I mean, what Isaiah finds, and, and Isaiah is, is a man who is righteous and holy, but in the presence of God, what does he say? What does he say of himself? I am, a, I am an undone man. Who am I to be in the presence of God? Who am I to be in the presence of the all in all? And that's where God is calling us in Christ. To know that we are a part of the, the all in all. That you belong in the, in the all in all. That your marriage belongs in the all in all. That your family belongs in the all in all. That's God's plan. That was God's design for you. And, and you may have made choices that put it in a different place. But God's design is for it to be right there in His hand where He is glorified in it all. In Matthew 22, Jesus says that you are supposed to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with everything that is in you. You are to love God. There's that word all again. And, and our our struggle is, is that we we want to we want to love the things of the world, and we want to love God, and and that's not loving God with all of ourselves, with all of our heart. And as long as we're still there, as long as we're still trying to to make God be accepting of well, we want to we want to love you, God, with most. Some of us, all, maybe most of us, as long as we're still trying to work out a deal that somehow we can mix this together and not give it all to God, we're going to struggle. And Christ doesn't call us to, 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 give us, to give part of ourselves to God. And He didn't give the example that says, well, you know, you can, you can hold on to part of yourself. His example is that he gave it all. He walked with God in obedience. He was 100% man, but he walked in obedience in 100% righteousness. And that is what got us victory over that sinful despair destructive thing that keeps us from the presence of God. That's the big picture. You know, and we we wrestle with uh, we wrestle with the little things and, and the little things are just the little things. You know? The big picture is that God, God God is seated on the throne. God is in control of all things. I was listening to a message by R.C. Sproul about, uh, well, about he used the illustration or used the reference in Scripture of Joseph. When Joseph has gone through all of the all of the bad stuff, and uh, his brothers, you know, says, his brothers sell him into slavery, and and he spends his life, a big part of his life, in prison, and just complete and away from his family, away from his home. And I, I mean, 
God uses that to save his family. And eventually, Joseph's brothers meet with Joseph again. And Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And his brothers reasonably think, well, he's going to kill us. Because he has, and he has every right to kill us. And now he's sitting in a place where he has all authority to kill us. And so they figure he's going to kill us. He's going to have us put to death. And Joseph says to them, what you intended for evil, God has meant for good. And Joseph is, is able to see that, that God is even in control of those who would mean evil. God is in control of all things. So as we, as we pursue this relationship with Christ and Christ in us, all, in all of us, really in control of all of us, remember that picture. God is God over all things. He's the one who is exalted. This space was sharing some texts this week, dealing with people who are in situations that are hard situations because of bad choices. And trying to figure out the best way to be a, a help in that. And to not get down yourself because... You see how people can get in places where you start to believe that there maybe there really is no. You need to have Isaiah's vision. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. So this morning, in this cold. I want you to see the Lord seated on the throne. He is God. He is God. It was, it was strange because I really, I don't have any trouble sleeping. And there were two nights where I couldn't sleep. And I, I went to bed thinking, man, I need this sleep. I haven't felt well, and I'm excited about going to bed and going to sleep. And 2.30, I, I roll over, it's 2.30. I'm like, 2.30? When was the last time I've seen 2.30? And then 2.45, and then 3 o'clock. And I'm like, I've got to get up. I can't sleep. I have to get up. And so I get up, and I go down to the... To the uh, kitchen table and I start to read through Genesis. And it's, I, it's like I'm seeing things that brighter than I've ever seen them before. Seeing new things. And wrestling through the scriptures about what I'm seeing. And then getting excited about man, this is, this is good information. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking, wow, God must be pleased with me. He's given me this information. And then, I'm like, then I think, what am I going to do with this information? I don't even want to share it with people. Because I don't know that I can back it up. I'm not sure that it, that it all really makes sense. And that gives, it takes me... And, it's like, let me, let me be honest with you. I, my relationship with the Lord, and I've shared this before, my relationship with the Lord is a strange one. <laughs> and people say, ask me questions about it, and I hear people talk about it, and I'm like, I don't, I don't see that. That's not, that's not the way that, that this is working for me or whatever. Mine is, it's a, this is a strange thing. Why 
God allows me to be a part of any of this is a strange thing. And I don't, I don't mean that in any, any other way but to all the glory, the glory to Him. I praise Him for that. I praise Him that He, he has me so confused that all I can do is say, all the glory goes to you, God. All the glory goes to you. You are worthy of all praise. I have a strong relationship with my wife. I, I love my family, and my family is turning out okay. <laughs> All the glory to God. All the glory to Him. I don't know how He works the way He does. I can't pin to it. But I know that it's all the glory to Him. He is seated on the throne. He is high and lifted up. Share this morning because we're we're going to continue to to plug plug through this this letter to the Corinthians and and it, it really does work on hard stuff but it's worth it I mean and what Paul what Paul is uh, <coughs> the amazing um, wisdom of Paul. As he is allowing himself, who, uh, I mean, when I look at Paul, I think about uh, just the, the, the knowledge that he had of God, the knowledge that he had of what Christ had done. I mean, Paul was a man who was, who I would say, he is worthy of honor. And he allowed himself to be almost nothing to minister to broken people. And to minister to people who were wrestling with what it meant to be a Christian. And who were trying to figure out what it meant to be, or hopefully trying to figure out what it meant to be spiritually mature. And he had people who professed to be spiritually mature who were the more immature spiritual people and they were in leadership. And Paul confronted them. Because what Christ was doing was glorifying the one who is seated upon the throne who is holy, holy, holy. It wasn't building some sort of man-made religion. It wasn't, it wasn't bringing some sort of heavenly message down and making it earthly. It's, it's the real life-changing message of the gospel of Christ that redeems fallen man back to a holy God. I don't know where you are in um, in your own walk. I don't, know, I don't know where you are in your relationship with the Lord and what the Lord is dealing with in you to bring you back to Himself or to, to bring you to that place where you need to be. And, and I don't know what you think of Baptists or South Canaan Baptist Church or me or The, the little details. <laughs> but keep your eye on, on the Lord, on God, mm -hmm. on the one who's seated on the throne.
it's, a, it's amazing to me how he works. You know, and, and it's comforting to me when I see in the Gospel of John when the disciples finally think that they really understand what Jesus is saying. And they say, finally, we hear, we understand, and you're speaking plainly to us. And then Jesus turns to them and says, do you really hear? Do you really understand? Because I'm, I'm thinking you higher. So, so when you think, you know, when I'm sitting at the breakfast table and I feel like the Lord is speaking to me and He's revealing His Word, it's, it's easy for me to even in that place, to, to begin to lose sight of that glory, this glory is God's. It's easy for me in the flesh to start thinking that something about me. And as soon as I start thinking that it's something about me, I lose the vision that I really need to keep. To flip-flop that, like I was talking about with the guitar. If all I ever, ever really get to play is three frets on the guitar. If I have damaged myself, my brain, so badly that I can't learn any more than that. God is the God of all in all. I can glorify Him with what I have. And if I become, could become the best guitar player that you had ever seen in your life, God would look at me and say, if it's not for my glory, so what? It's all about Him. It's all about the glory of God. And I think that's, I mean, I just was kind of float, floating. It's, it's crazy because you're kind of floating and... What's it about me? Doesn't matter what it is. It's about glorifying Him. So, I just wanted to, I don't know, I felt like it needed to share. I was like, it was a, a mini revival for me. And He is worthy of all praise.